Hello, all of you. Welcome to the first bit of the tailoring class that you have signed up for. I decided that uh, while I am sending out the materials list, I should probably talk about um, what it all means, where to get it, and um, basically the gist of what you can substitute as far as what you already have and what you will probably need to invest in. So we're gonna go over piece by piece. Um, so this is for all of the classes, the individual classes with what's needed for each one is broken down in the list that I've sent you by email, but this is all of it all compiled together. Um, with the understanding that uh, most of you are going to probably take all of them. Um, so if you want to get stuff all at once, this is where you can get it. Don't feel obligated to get all of it all at once though. If you have enough to get you started, that's fine. Uh, the syllabus that I'll be sending out also has uh, what's needed per class. So as long as you have that, um, when you are starting, the, that daily class, that's fine. So we have 11 yards of muslin, which is an estimate, um, depending widely on how large of a person you're going to be making this stuff for. Uh, if you are using a, a teddy bear for <laughs> your suit making, it's probably going to be significantly less. Um, if you have questions about how much you will need for mock-ups and so forth for a uh, more specific size, please feel free to contact me. Um, but uh, this is one of those things that having extra muslin around is very useful and you're gonna be using it uh, clean pieces for your samples that you will probably want to invest in um, or pull from your stash. I don't really care if it's uh, plain muslin. You can use a broadcloth if that's what you have already, as long as it's plain woven, preferably cotton, uh, just because that'll be easier and faster for you to work with with the mock-ups and the, um, the samples. You can also use you know, scraps of fabric that are left over from other projects. That's just fine for the samples as well. Um, as far as muslin, I'm talking about the American version of muslin, which is a plain, um, gray good cotton. Um, a, also, if you are going to, well, you're gonna be mocking up the uh, coat as well as the vest, you'll probably want a heavier material for the coat and the vest so that you don't have to invest in any of the guts yet while you're testing out your patterns. Um, as far as patterns go, we are going to go over how to draft your own, but if you want for the actual building of it for slightly faster, feel free to use commercial pattern if you feel more comfortable with that. Um, you will have the, uh, we will be going over uh, the drafting to start with, but it's fine if you want to use uh, something else or a pattern you already have or a pattern you've already drafted, that's fine. Uh, but anyway, so if to cut down on, or to get us closer to what the finished product is going to be, using a slightly thicker canvas is, can be very helpful to get to a shape that will inform better of how the end product will hang and be able to see where the wrinkles are and what needs to be fixed in the fittings and so forth. So that's what that is. Um, if you don't want to go with a thicker, if, if you just get a thicker or stiffer muslin, or if you just want to starch the muslin that you were working with, you can just get all muslin. That's okay too. Then um, once again, it doesn't have to be plain gray good, um, that's just what I have as examples here um, to show what I mean by the basics of um, the most likely cheapest material that you can work with for this rather than what's already something that you might already have in your stash. Uh, 
you can also use leftover bits over and over again. Um, I usually use my muslin bits in pattern pieces until they are too small to reuse. Uh, so, and then I use them for stuffing. So there's that. Um, anyway, all right, so that's the basic draping materials. That's what these are for, um, for the mock-ups and so forth. All right, so where do you get this stuff? So let's talk a little bit about some of your options. Um, this is for your final product. Um, you do want to have one yard for the vest front. Um, a medium weight suiting wool is what I would recommend for people who are completely new to tailoring, um, but it, mostly because that will uh, be more forgiving as far as uh, making mistakes and so forth and not fraying out as you're working with it. Um, if you're going to do a three piece suit, then you might want to have um, seven yards all told. This is once again, uh, a slight overestimization. Uh, this would probably fit a, a larger person. So if you are, you know, building for a teddy bear or for a half scale, it's going to be a lot less than that. Um, but this is, I, I would say that unless you are an experienced tailor and have made a couple of suits before and you're using this opportunity to challenge yourself with a linen suit or a silk suit or a plaid suit, I would avoid all of those things. I would stick with um, at most a, a chalk stripe. Um, but preferably probably a, a tweedy kind of or plain color uh, would be easiest for your first try as well as um, a woolen medium weight suiting. Uh, woolens are fluffier and uh, will definitely hide more of your um, potential lumps and bumps and so forth and be able to see the difference that you're making a little bit easier and faster as you are shaping the wool. Uh, worsted is also fine. If you if you want to do a lighter weight uh, worsted wool, that's fine. Um, that's the smoother kind of less fuzzy stuff. Um, carded being slightly fuzzier than the combed. Comb can be super smooth. Uh, that will show more of what your guts look like on the outside. So you will want to be very careful with that um, if you choose to go with a combed worsted wool. Um, if you're looking at some of the super numbers, I wouldn't go above 180 um, unless you are very experienced. Uh, the higher the number, the, the thinner the yarns and the finer the fabric. Um, so I would say you probably want to stick to anything under 180 and you know probably above 80. Um, as far as the weight, when I say medium weight, I'm talking like nine to 12 ounces uh, ish. Um, if you want to do a lightweight summer weight wool, that's uh, 6.5 to 8.5 ounces. Um, if you want to do a, a heavyweight winter weight, that's fine too. And if you want to make an overcoat for your um, coat, that's also fine. That's going to be in the 14 to 19 ounce range. Now, where are you going to get all this stuff that I'm going to talk about later? Let's talk about some of the brands and some of the shops that you can go to. So um, as far as suitings that are going to be inexpensive, uh, potentially for students and so forth, I know SR Harris Fabrics has a sale currently going on on some of the leftover wools. Um, you do have to call them. They don't have a website where you can just browse uh, and ask them about their $6 a yard wools. Um, they do have more expensive woolens as well, uh, but it's probably worth calling during the week, during the day, if you can. They do ship. Um, you can ask them about that as well. Uh, it will probably be harder to get all three items to match completely, but you can probably ask for uh, a reasonable amount of, at a reasonable price. Now, if you want to go to the... Uh, more expensive side of really beautiful wools. Um, 
and you want to invest in making something and you want or if you want something specific um going to be black and sons they're in um uh, la they really know what they're talking about they're very patient um you can go onto their website and they do sell stuff on their website as well as if you call them they will also be able to answer questions and so forth um if you want some really beautiful english rules um as well as some of the weirder or more difficult to find uh tailoring materials uh mcculloch and wallace is a really good place to find um tailoring linens as well as beautiful wools and the hymo and you know all of the the guts kind of things same with william gee uh they have a lot of the harder to find um uh, tailoring guts um Waverly's is also a UK based uh, store. They are a really good resource for inexpensive uh, guts and so forth. Uh, they do have some of the more obscure items at uh, very reasonable prices. They do take forever to get there though. So um, if you're going to go with Waverly's, uh, order soon <laughs> for your stuff um bias bespoke is an etsy that also carries a lot of the more obscure um tailoring guts and um they do smaller cuts of things so if you you know only need enough to do the two cuffs and you don't want to invest in a whole roll of wigan um you might want to call them um if you are looking for tools and thread and um, the um, best possible prices for those, I highly recommend uh, Wawak, Manhattan Wardrobe Supply, or um, Ben Ashes uh, as very um, cost effective. Wawak is just barely less expensive than Ben Ashes, um, and they're really good at delivering very quickly. They have warehouses both on the East Coast and the West Coast, um, and their prices are very difficult to beat. Uh, Ban Ashes is very close. Manhattan Wardrobe Supply is a little bit more expensive. Uh, they did just redo their website though, so it's a lot less uh, eye searing as, than it used to be, if you remember the old one. Um, they do have some of the more obscure, obscure stuff. Um, and are very good at uh, mailing stuff out quickly. Okay, so speaking of weird and obscure uh, guts. So let's talk HIMO. You do want to match the weight of your HIMO to the wool that you choose. So if you're going with really lightweight, you want a lightweight HIMO. If you're going with a medium weight, you want a medium weight HIMO. If you're going with super heavyweight, you want a heavyweight HIMO. Um, it is expensive, but you don't need all that much of it. Um, hair cloth, unless you're going with a medium uh, woolen to a heavyweight to a coating weight, uh, you probably don't need the hair cloth, uh, but if you are going with that, I would recommend it for more English chest um, that's stiffer. Um, sometimes HIMO is also called hair cloth. Don't confuse the two. The two examples on the left here are um, when I refer to HIMO, this is what I mean. It's mixed with goat hair and cotton, and you do want to pre shrink it. So you do want to uh, press it when you get it um, with a hot iron and some steam. Um, because it will shrink a little bit. You do not want to get the fusible stuff. You want to get the sewing stuff because that's what I'm going to be teaching you. The fusible stuff, you stick it into a hot car and that suit that you spent so much time building can really go sideways quickly. Um, it is a good thing to be able to use and know how to use in instances where you want to use it, but that's not, we're going to be learning the old school methods in this in, you know, so don't get the, the fusible uh, HIMO for this. Um, when I'm talking about hair cloth, what I'm meeting is the stuff that used to be made out of horse tails. So it's a very thin width of um, material. It's, 
you know, now made with nylon usually, and it only really rolls one way. So it really holds the contour really well and creates a very stiff English chest. Um, and that's, you know, a, a really nice, um, nice way to get a good stiff chest for, um, you know, overcoats and heavy woolens and so forth. Um, for smoothing out your pad stitching, um, I like to either use some baby flannel, which as long as you have a fairly dark colored uh, wool, which I highly recommend, do not go with white unless you really want to go with white. If you're really go wanting to go with white, you do have to match all of your interiors. So you do have to get the specialty light colored Hymo and the specialty um, light colored Wigan and so forth. Um, if you are going with a dark wool, uh, it doesn't matter as much. Um, and you can use regular tailor's chalk and so forth to mark on it. So that's, uh, it is easier if you are, unless you are trying to challenge yourself, go with a darker color. Um, anyway, so uh, baby flannel, I don't really care if it has trucks on it or whatever, it's not gonna show. Um, unless your wool is particularly thin, it's basically to create a softer, smoother layer. Um, Ice wool is the expensive, beautiful version of that. It creates a lot of loft without a lot of weight or density. It is much more expensive than the baby bee flannel and harder to get, but it is a joy to work with when you can get it. Um, yeah, so the, your choice, baby flannel, ice wool, whichever fits your budget and what you wanna try, that's fine. Um, for tailor's tape or bias chiffon, um, so that's we're looking up over here on, on the upper right side here uh, for Taylor's tape. It is not twill tape. You want Taylor's tape. That is a, a not on the bias. There's there's no twill to it. It's a straight um, plain weave tape. It can be white or black or um, this natural color here. That's fine. Uh, it doesn't really matter what color as long as you have a dark wool. Um, if it is a light colored wool, once again, you do have to match that. Um, and you want that for the um, medium white wool um, the, uh, to, to the coating white. So you want medium white, heavy white, and the, the coating white wools. You will want tailor's tape. If you are working with something very fine or very thin, um, if you cut up by a chiffon, in um, strips of uh, about an inch or an inch and a half wide at most, um, that will serve quite well um, in as your edging tape, that's fine. Um, it'll create a nice thin crisp edge for your super fine um, and, or lightweight uh, combs, uh, wools, so you know, the, Use your best discretion with that. Um, also, if you're using a silk or a linen, um, I would probably go with the bias chiffon as well. Once again, not if this is your first suit. Don't do silk or linen if it's your first suit. Um, all right, so um, fine tailoring linen. Um, this is, you know, the red edge linen. It's very thin, very stiff. Um, you do want to wet it down and let it hang and then press it because it will shrink a little bit. Um, we're going to use that in the waistbands of the trousers. Um, you don't have to get waistbanding. We're going to make our own. Um, and this is going to be for very thin, fine waistbands. Um, if you can't get your hands on tailoring linen, um, you can you can use high mow in a pinch. That's okay. It is fatter. Um, it's more pokey. <laughs> We would have to finish the edges of that instead of um, with the, the tailoring linen, which we wouldn't. Um, but I'll walk you through that if you can't afford or can't find the tailoring linen. Um, if you have a, a super fine, uh, very densely woven linen that isn't tailoring linen and you want to use that instead and just starch it, that's okay. I mean, it won't hold up as well, but um, I understand, you know, trying to use stuff up from your. Um, stash and so forth so that's fine we can you know you'll, you'll get the gist of it you're going to be learning the skills regardless um of and we'll work with the materials that you have and honestly when it comes down to it you very rarely get to 
dictate from the get-go exactly what materials you're going to be able to get when you're building a suit. So some flexibility is, um, is good. Um, and learning to use different materials is really good for being able to know what's good in what situations. Um, so for um, your wig in, that's for your cuffs. Um, if you are working with medium weight through the coating weight, you'll probably want wig in. It's, it's a, a bias woven, um, a stiffer material. You can get it in different weights. You wanna match the weight to what you're making. Um, if you're working with something very lightweight, um, you'll probably want to go with the bias chiffon again, but in four inch strips. Um, and if you're going, you know, between the, the lighter end of the medium weight to the lightweight, you can also use um, some tailoring linen there as well. Um, and that's fine. Okay, so French collar canvas. This is one place where I would say don't skimp. Um, French collar canvas or collar canvas is, it, there's nothing that rolls like it. It's beautiful. It works really well. You don't need all that much of it. Um, and it's worth investing in. Um, it is expensive. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but get the good stuff. You're worth it. It's going to roll beautifully. Um, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a stiffened kind of linen. Um, and it's fantastic. Uh, if you're going to spend money anywhere and if you're going to skimp anywhere, this is the place not to do it. <laughs> if you want to um, have a melted under collar, that basically just means that it can be a little bit flatter, a little bit thinner. Um, it's a very densely felted wool so that you can just do a cut edge and um, overstitch it. Um, if you don't want to have a contrasting or melt an under collar, that's fine too. You can just do an under collar with a matching wool with your exterior, that's fine too. You just have to finish the edges and that's okay. Um, I'll walk you through it. Um, but if you want to melt an under collar, that's how much you need, that's fine. Um, for your pocketing Silesia, um, if you don't want to spend on the pocketing, um, it is just densely woven uh, cotton that holds up really well to wear and tear. But if you wanna use muslin, I'm not gonna judge you for using muslin or broadcloth. Um, it does mean that your pocket's probably not gonna last as long. Um, you might end up with, um, you know, if you get sand in it, it might go through, you know, that's fine. Um, and you might end up, you know, 20 years down the line having to replace your pocketing. That's, that's okay. Uh, but, um, if you're, you know, going out there and you're just buying all the stuff for your, um, for your suit, pocketing silesia is fantastic. Um, and it's very useful for doing really nice, you know, pockets that'll last a long time. Um, and you can use it for other bits too. If you are doing your cuffs and you want something lightweight, but you don't have, um, you know, tailoring linen extras, you can use uh, pocketing for that. Um, if you don't want to use uh, tailor's tape to pull in your um, your plastron chest bit, you can use um, a little scrap of silesia for that, that's fine. Um, there, it, it's useful for a lot of stuff. It's, it's, it's um, densely woven cotton. It's usually shiny on one side because um, it's, it's polished a little. Um, on just the one side <laughs> and the cats are just accidentally one fell off and onto the other one that was funny um anyway okay so um for the lining um that's the lining for the vest um some people like to do lining in a broadcloth or a pocketing um that's also fine if you want to get plain pocketing for your vest lining or vest back. Um, that's also fine. Um, you can also use, you know, rayon lining if that's what you have. That's why I have that split up here. You do want to have something slippery for the interior of your coat. Um, if you have some scrap silk laying around, you can use that. Um, I included the the yardage for the facings of wool in the the wool yardage, obviously. But uh, for the lining, you can go with uh, a, a rayon, a silk, the, you know, whatever. As long as it's slippery. Um, traditionally, you do a white for the sleeves, um, just so that uh, when you sweat, you don't 
transfer color, but um, that's done a lot less now. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to you know, judge you for <laughs> using what you have or what you can find or what you like. Um, you can do basically whatever you want for the lining. Uh, as long as you can get the coat on and off again, uh, you should be fine. Uh, for the double fold bias binding, that is uh, one, you know, the one quarter inch stuff. Uh, you're going to use that uh, largely for your samples of, um, for your Hong Kong finishes, as well as um, uh, some of the other things. So it, that it's not even a full packet. <laughs> so if you have some extras lying around, it doesn't have to match anything. Um, that's just for your own edification. For the cotton cording or candle wicking, um, the only reason why I recommend candle wicking instead of cotton cording that you can buy at like Joann's um, is that candle wicking tends to be very dense. Um, and so you don't end up with as much wibbly kind of showing through. Um, that's gonna be for your sleeve head sample, um, for making a sleeve head and for um, uh, showing a corded sleeve head. Um, if you want to do uh, corded sleeve heads for your coat, you're welcome to do so as well. Um, you can also get that same sort of look with like a shoelace. <laughs> um, any kind of cording is fine for that. Um, whatever you may have lying around is fine. Um, if you want to use a pre-made sleeve header, that's fine. Um, you can also, uh, if you want to make it yourself, I highly recommend cotton quilt batting. Uh, that will work great for folding it over yourself and uh, making a good little sleeve header. Um, there are lots of different options for making sleeve headers. If you're doing a really poofy like 1890s women's sleeve, um, using something stiffer is is better. Um, but I would stay away from you know organdy and um, organza and that sort of thing for men's suits unless you're getting into like 1830s really poofy um, uh, sleeve heads. Um, so that's that's what that is for. Okay, so now we're getting into the nitty gritty kind of stuff. So these are kinds of things that are for your samples for the most part here. Um, all these little tiny chunks of things. Uh, feel free to just grab something from a former project that's just a little strip of things. Um, it's basically so that you can show gathers in uh, different densities and in different fabrics, right? So that's why I gave you know, a, a thin kind of wafty material like chiffon would be great for one. Something stiff like tulle would be great for one. Um, for stripes patterned in plaid, um, those are just for pattern magic, uh, pattern matching practice. Uh, so those also just something that you may have that you dug up from, um, you know, a, an old shirt that has fallen apart is fine, um, or, you know, from bits of old projects are fine. If you want to go out and buy something specific, that's also fine. Um, I would probably stick with um, fairly easy to work with fabrics. I would go into uh, knits or polyesters or, um, you know, uh, Euro jersey for these, unless you feel like it. Um, I would, if you're looking for the easiest option, you can draw some stripes onto a scrap of muslin. You can draw um, a pattern on if you want. You can uh, draw a plaid on if you want. I, that's fine. Um, it's it's just for your practice. So that's you know, um, scraps using what you've got. It's all good for the coat. Um, depending on which kind of coat you want to make, uh, one to three large buttons, unless you're doing like a military one, you know, if you have a coat specifically in mind, um, count the buttons, that's fine. Um, they're usually uh, 24L to 30L for the front buttons. Um, if you are making it for a particularly small person, being, form, whatever, um, you can go smaller than that, that's fine. Um, if you want to go to scale, uh, for the cuff buttons, they're usually 20 to 24L. Um, and 
if you want you know three buttons per cuff then you need six and if you want four um you need eight and if you want to do you know fancy interior pockets that button shut uh you'll need some more than that and that's you know up to you um if, if you want more but for the basics um these are roughly what you want um you do want one shank button for your sampler um as well as one extra four hole or two extra four hole buttons for your um for your sampler as well um you'll want somewhere between three and ten vest buttons uh those are also going to be the smaller uh size for the most part although some vests do get big buttons um if you want to make big buttons that's fine um some of them are tiny um if you look at some of the 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 white tie vests they can have you know three eighths inch buttons they're just itty bitty um you can pick whatever you want this is not a design class um this is you know going to be how you make it so um pick whatever you want what makes you happy what you know, looking at it for 30 weeks, you're not going to get sick of. Uh, <laughs> from, from you know, next month until next January, this is, you're going to be looking at it for a long time. So pick something you like. Um, for suspender buttons, we're going to do a, um, a button fly for your sampler, as well as uh, if you want a button fly for the trousers that you're making. If you don't feel like doing a zipper for those, or if you don't want to have to replace a zipper later, um, you're welcome to to get suspender buttons for those as well. Um, by suspender buttons, I mean that you can Google suspender buttons. They are um, pretty standard. They are four hole buttons with little grooves in them for where your thread goes. Um, they, they're very plain, very boring, but they work really well. So. Um, you do want a bunch of suspender buttons because we're going to use those for all sorts of things. Um, also for your uh, fall front trousers, we're going to use some suspender buttons for that. Um, so for zippers, let's take a look up here for a second. So these are the three main kinds of non-invisible zippers. Um, I'm recommending metal tooth zippers, but if you are, um, if you are, making stuff just for your uh sampler and what you have to hand are coiled zippers like like this here or you know plastic tooth zippers that's fine like it's just for sampler um if you're going out and buying one um or if you're putting one of your zippers into your trousers i would recommend metal tooth zippers largely because uh they just hold up better um the plastic tooth zippers hold up pretty well too um but not quite as much as the metal tooth zippers and coil zippers just blow out and nobody wants that in a fly like just no um they're fine and they're thinner um and they're really good at what they do uh but um under pressure uh no <laughs> so uh but since for your sampler uh you're, you're not going to put the fly under pressure using a coil zipper for that is fine uh use what you have if they're too long you can always cut them down um and just in general those are rough estimates for how long you need your zippers to be if you're going out to go and find some um but that's what i mean when i when i say a metal toothed zipper versus a plastic toothed zipper versus a coiled zipper um yeah okay so um if you are working with very lightweight fabric or um, between lightweight to medium weight, um, you'll want a skirt hook. Um, and if you're working with the you know heavier end of medium weight to heavy to coating weight for your trousers, you will probably want a trouser hook. Um, so a skirt hook looks like the bigger picture here and trouser hook looks like the smaller one right there. Uh, they're both so in don't get the the kinds with the two which are i mean they're fun to put in whack it with a hammer any day you get to whack something with a hammer is a good day right but um when they fail they fail more spectacularly and they tend to poke people um 
they are great if you're making a whole bunch of stuff, but I wouldn't recommend it for our purposes here. Um, get the sewing kind. When they fail, you can just sew on another one. Um, and it's more likely that it's going to fail at the thread rather than at the fabric, so you don't have to replace the whole waistband. So um, I have opinions. Uh, <laughs> as much as the tooth ones look cool and they're fun to put in. Um, for this purpose, I would say get the get the sewing kinds. Um, so you also need two shoulder pads. They don't have to be thick. If you don't want them to be thick, that's fine. Um, you're probably going to want to use your, your own personal discretion for that. If you want to make your own, that's fine as well. Um, but uh, I'm only going to very briefly kind of go over what you want to do to be able to shape them and make them yourself if you want to make them. Um, if you want more in depth let me know we can be flexible on that but for the most part you can just go out and buy uh tailor shoulder pads i would recommend the kind that's um uh sewn together rather than needle felted together um yeah so cotton usually is good um as far as how tall they are you can use your own discretion for that it really depends on the person some people uh can really pull off like a three-quarter inch giant shoulder pad, you know, off the shoulder kind of 80s look. Um, other people are tiny and need like little quarter inch ones. Um, some people are very large and need, you know, one inch ones. That's that's fine, right? Um, use your best discretion there. Um, okay, so for thread, um, I don't really care what kind of thread you use. If it works on your machine and you're comfortable with it, that's fine. Um, if you want for your samplers to use something that contrasts so that you can see what you did, feel free. Um, for what you're actually going to make, I do want you to match it though. Um, it, you know, or contrast it purposefully if you really want to show off some top stitching or whatever, that's fine too. Um, I really like the Mara 100 Guterman thread, um, but you know, that's just, if you want a suggestion. Um, as far as cotton basting thread goes, I really like the um, the smoother, stiffer stuff that I have in the picture over here. Uh, you are more than welcome to use the Italian fluffier stuff if you prefer that. It tends to break a little bit more easily, which means that if you get it caught in something, you can just you know break it off and call it good. Uh, but it does mean that sometimes it's harder to get your you know, tweezers in and pull out the last little bits of it, as opposed to the stiffer stuff here that um, tends to come all out when you're pulling it. Um, if you don't have cotton basting thread or don't want to invest in constant cotton basting thread, you are more than welcome to just use up the last little bits of, um, you know, thread spools that you have lying around. That's fine too. Um, sticklers for, um, absolutely super proofing your pressing will say um, you want to use silk thread. Um, if you want to use silk thread, you're more than welcome to. Um, I, I use cotton thread um, and just am more careful when I'm pressing not to press in my cotton thread and leave dense. Um, and that's fine. Uh, so whatever you want to use for basting thread is fine. I'm just recommending the, this particular cotton thread. Um, but if yours looks like, um, you know, a Mardi Gras parade of colors of all the little leftover bits, um, I will applaud you for your thriftiness. And that's that's good stuff. Um, that's just fine. Uh, the masking tape is just for when we're fitting. Um, so that's more or less a slightly faster way of um, just adding on a little bit of extra if you are uh, that you can write on. Um, if you want to quickly go through stuff. Um, another option to that is just basting on quick a little bit of um, extra muslin that's on grain. Um, if you prefer that method, that's fine too. That's, I'm just recommending masking tape. It's not absolutely required. For the um, binder, it is going to be thick. It is gonna be a thick one. Um, I would recommend a five inch three, three ring binder. You can split it up among multiple other three ring, three ring binders. You can stick it in an envelope. You can just tack it on your wall as decoration, eh, whatever, right? Stick it on your fridge with magnets. That's fine too, whatever. Um, but if you wanted it all in one place, five inch three ring binder should do it. 
um, other optional items if you want to go above and beyond and try new weird things. Um, if you want to try some super um, full gathers when we're doing the gathers for your um, for your sampler, Weed Whacker replacement string is fantastic. It will absolutely kick stuff out like um, picture line dancers poofiness. It adds a lot of poofiness. It adds a lot of stiffness. Um, it's inexpensive and easy to get a hold of. Um, yeah, the, for, for your um, gathers, if you want to play with that, feel free. Um, if you want to play with some uh, horsehair hem, that's also fine. I can walk you through that. Um, if you are going to try those, I would recommend getting some extra tool. Um, I would recommend having some sort of wax, either uh, beeswax or thread heaven. Um, since we're going to be doing a lot of hand sewing, I like waxing my own thread and pressing it uh, to keep it from being squirrely and nodding up on me. Uh, if you hate working with wax, I, I get it. That's okay. Um, you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, I would recommend trying it. Um, once, once you've pressed your thread, it's hard to go back. Uh, you do want to press it between paper because it will leave marks on your pressing surface. Um, but um, I would highly recommend that. Um, for your um, practicing buttonholes, buttonhole thread, you can use like a thicker mercantized cotton for that. Um, that's fine. You can use silk thread, that's fine. You can use your Mara 100 Guterman thread, that's fine. Um, you'll you'll make it work. It'll be good practice regardless of what you use. Um, if you want to practice doing your buttonhole over GIMP, that is also absolutely fine. Um, I, I realize GIMP is difficult to find and is fairly expensive. Um, if you don't want to, and it's a very particular look. And if you don't want to do that, that's fine. Um, for your um, Sampler, if you want to use extra scraps of Taylor's linen, wig and Hymo or um, the other alternatives that we went over before to have those in your sampler, um, I would recommend having those, especially extra samples to be able to hand out to uh, PAs, or not PAs, fabric shoppers or designers that you're working with so that they know what in the world you're talking about. Um, since oftentimes, you know, if, they haven't specifically gone shopping for a tailor. It can be weird. They, we are asking for weird things here. And I realize that that's one of the reasons why we're going over this right now. Um, if you are making a vest that should have hardware in the back, um, you'll want to get that. Um, if you're doing a fitted back and you don't need any hardware, that's fine. If you're doing a, um, a tied back, that's fine. If you're doing a, um, a, um, the laced back, that's also fine. Um, pick out what you want, go with that. Uh, right, so as far as tools go, the basic tools that are required is you have to have access to a sewing machine. You have to use pattern paper. Now I've included some of the pattern papers that are um, most commonly used. Um, I tend to really like working with brown paper. Um, some people really like um, the, the dot paper for the graphing side of it. I know some people use uh, wrapping paper with the grid on the back. Um, I find that to be a little bit thin, but you know, your, your mileage may vary. Some people really like butcher paper because then you can see through um, to be when you are adding seam allowance, if you are the type of person that likes seam allowance on your patterns. Um, it's also really useful for if you are swinging darts and that sort of thing. I, I understand liking uh, butcher paper or clear vinyl. I know some people really like having that as well. Um, if you are making or working with uh, stock, you know, a, a stock 42 pattern, having it out of tag board or oak tag is um, something that's pretty, pretty common too. Um, I don't really care. As long as you can practice and, um, have something to write on you can use you know brown paper bags you can you know, that, that, that you've flat, flattened out um it, whatever's fine as, as long as you are learning we're all good um you will need pins um 
if you want to baste everything beforehand, uh, before running it through the machine, instead of uh, pinning it as much, that's also fine. Uh, but you will need some pins. Um, you'll need needles, hand machine, hand and machine needles. Um, this is a pretty large project, so you are probably going to go through them. Um, I don't really care whether you prefer milliners or sharps or in betweens uh, for hand needles. Pick something that you're comfortable with. Um, have a variety. There are some. Uh, really good YouTube videos. I think um, I think Miss Cox, Miss Abby Cox, did a whole thing on um, uh, different brands and, and different types of hand needles. Um, I'd watch that if you have any questions. Um, a thimble, a thimble will be required. Um, if you prefer a leather thimble, that's fine. If you prefer a tailor thimble with no top on the end. That's fine. We'll, we will be talking a little bit about uh, fitting your thimble. Um, the fun part, once again, whacking things with a hammer, always a good day, right? Um, but you will need one. You will need one that fits. Um, if you want to do the traditional tying on your thimble, um, you will need a tailor thimble without a top. Um, you can find those at Wawak, Banab, 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 Bishes, um, Banashes. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, among like Etsy, all sorts of different stuff. Um, you can find them all sorts of places. Used, new, whatever, right? Um, but you will need one. You'll need one that fits. I would recommend if you don't already have one that you like, get a variety and try them out. Um, and, you know, find one that um, is a little bit snug when it's per perfectly circular, and when you whack with a little bit of a hammer, um, it goes to the nice oval of your fingertip, and uh, yeah, you're gonna use those. Um, rulers, you're gonna need a ruler. You're gonna have to measure stuff, especially if you are, when we are doing the drafting, right? Uh, pencils, some people prefer mechanical pencils. I really like um, this particular brand of pencil. I got turned on to and I have never looked back. The erasers work really well. Um, they're really consistent. They're easy to erase and easy to write with and keep point. I love them. Um, and they're pretty inexpensive. So like get yourself a jar of, of very nice sharp pencils and it, the, you know, get that nice dopamine where you can. Um, you will need a measuring tape. Um, you will need an iron and an ironing surface. I don't really care whether you're using industrial iron, a home iron. Um, if you have an ironing board, an ironing table, even if you just have some towels thrown down um, or a um, having something that you can press on is good. That, that will save you some frustration. So um, a, a fairly sturdy surface is good, um, but they do sell um, ironing mats that you can just roll up if you live in a tiny apartment like myself, um, or if you want to have it for your kit, if you're, uh, I, I would highly recommend those. Those are pretty inexpensive. Also, uh, you can find them at most retailers online. Um, some sort of scissors or rotary cutter. I'm not gonna judge you either way, that's fine. Use what you're more comfortable with, switch in between, that's fine. Um, don't use the same scissors <laughs> for paper as you do with your fabric though. Um, that that I, I will cringe at every time. Um, so for some of the recommended tools that I think you will find very useful, um, a two inch by 18 inch clear plastic ruler is pretty much industry standard in a lot of different places for very good reason. Um, you can do long lines of half inch seam allowances. You can, um, measure out exactly how far this is and see where you are. Um, I highly recommend that. For doing the drafting, if you don't have a tailor square and want to invest in one, they are not the same thing as a dressmaker square. Um, you want to make sure that if you are investing in one, it has the uh, fractions broken down and the, the ratios broken down on the interior edge like this. It's not just uh, a carpenter square. Um, they are different things. I'll go over how to use it. If you uh, can't or um, don't want to invest in a tailor square right now, 
it's just more math. You, you have access to the internet. You can get to a calculator. That's fun, right? Um, it's just a little bit faster and a little bit easier with a Taylor Square. Um, and if you're gonna do a lot of this, get a Taylor Square. If not, do you use a calculator, that's fine. Um, once again, the Guterman thread, um, you don't really need the really thick stuff unless you're planning on uh, like the 70 or 80, um, unless you are planning to do top stitching or like jeans type stuff. So um, 100 should be fine. Um, for your gathering, if you want to speed it up a little bit, um, using a thick mercenized, mercenized cotton thread um, or a, a thick button thread um, to zigzag over and gather is fine. Uh, you can also just run a longer stitch. That's also fine. If you haven't used friction pens before, I highly recommend them. They're really convenient. They do go away when you press. Um, they're not great for taking notes, but they're great for marking things that you want to disappear. Um, that's going to be mostly useful for your sampler stuff. Since I'm recommending using dark wool, um, you're probably going to use a lot of clay chalk for that, honestly. Um, so um yeah but if you haven't used them before it's something cool to try if you want to um once again my favorite brand of pencils taylor's chalk um i highly recommend getting some taylor's chalk um you don't want the taylor's wax uh since that will go away when you press it the taylor's chalk you do kind of have to um tap into the wall to stay for long periods of time um but um uh, and You'll need some sort of sharp surface to sharpen it on either a chalk box, a razor blade, your scissors, whatever, right? Um, but I highly recommend Taylor's chalk. Um, a Taylor's ham will come in useful when you're doing some of the, um, the darts and so forth. Um, if you want to make your own, there are plenty of good tutorials online. They're just stuffed with sawdust. Um, and they have some give to them so you can, you know, whack them and make them the shape that you want for forming collars um, or anything like that. Um, if you don't have one, you can make one, you can work around it, but it is going to be a lot easier if you have one. Um, some tailors use uh, tailors turkeys too, or giant ones or, you know, sleeve sized ones. Um, for the most part, I tend to use the ham sized one the most. The, the sausage sized ones I use sometimes, but the ham sized one I use the most. Um, sleeve boards are awesome. They're fairly expensive. Um, if you're gonna get one, I highly recommend a wooden one with a very strong um, arc um, underneath it for support. The metal ones tend not to hold up as well to tailoring um, just because we whack, we whack stuff. Um, and so <laughs> um, if you can find an old vintage one, um, or, you know, one of, there are merchants that sell them on Etsy that are new. Um, I would recommend that. Um, you don't need one, not really, but they are convenient. Um, a clapper, this is something you, you don't need. You can use your iron sort of, or something that's just kind of heavy and smooth. Um, but uh, clappers are great, clappers are fun. Um, you can wax stuff with a clapper and make it look nice. Um, I, you will have to have something to whack things with that is smooth and fairly dense and easy to hold on to. Um, but um, specifically, a wooden clapper is going to absorb the moisture the best and is generally the best tool for the job. Um, but if you don't have one, you'll figure it out, it'll be fine. Um, you can use uh, manila folders and just pressing on it by hand or with a book um, or just with a heavy object. Um, it's not gonna be as easy, but you totally can. Um, for opening your buttonholes, I highly recommend a chisel. Once again, whacking things with hammers is fun. Um, it also means that you can't accidentally over open your buttonholes. Um, it's glorious. It's, it's hard to go back to uh, a razor blade or a seam ripper um, or even a buttonhole scissors after you've used a chisel. It just gives you so much control. Um, and they're not that expensive, but um, that's what I would recommend for that. Once again, not required. Um, 
if you want to finish off the edges of your samplers, you can do whatever you want. You can use pinking shears, you can use an overlocker um, or a serger. You can just leave them plain. That's fine. You can turn them under and stitch them if you want. You can let them fray out if, for you know, all I care. But I would recommend um, uh, if you are going with a, a very thin wool or a silk or a linen, you will need a, an overlocker or a serger or some other way to finish the edge. If you're using medium weight or heavy weight or coating white wools, um, that becomes significantly less important. Um, but yeah, so that's what I would recommend there as far as tools go. And that's everything. So, um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, hopefully that has helped. I will be sending to you the generalized list that you can cross stuff off of as you go along. I hope that makes sense as far as um, where to be flexible and where not to be, what will be expected for the classes and uh, so forth. I look forward to seeing you in class.